Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm Frank, and I'm glad to be here at OSCON as one of the few hardware guys. Um, really excited to talk a little bit about the Open Compute Project. Just by show of hands, how many of you are already familiar with the Open Compute Project? Cool. Yeah, we started it just a little bit over a year ago. Um, when we couldn't get what we wanted from the market uh, in order to scale more efficiently our infrastructure, we decided to design and build it ourselves, um, which isn't unique, right? Some companies who came before us built their own infrastructure as well. What is unique is that we decided to open source it. Uh, and when we did that, a lot of people were thinking, why would Facebook go and build their own infrastructure and then open source it? Uh, and we were really intrigued by the benefits that we saw and the pace of innovation that we saw in the software community and wanted to apply that to the hardware space and just see what happens. And so anyway, I'm going to use a couple of historical examples um, to talk through this and, and really define why openness always wins. Uh, and first, I'm going to talk about trains. Uh, and so you're probably thinking, OK, this is awesome. There's a hardware guy on stage at OSCON talking to me about trains. But bear with me for a minute. Um, this is a historical point to just prove that openness and working together always wins. When you think about the way the train system uh, built out in the early 19th century, unfortunately, there was a lot of what I would call gratuitous differentiation in the width between the, trail, uh, between the railroad tracks. Um, and this created huge issues, especially for the biggest consumers of trains, um, people that wanted to move goods from north to south, east to west, um, unfortunately, what would happen is you'd get part of the way down your trip and the train gauge would change. So there would be a four to seven hour delay while they lifted the train up off the tracks, switched the wheels, put it back on another track to go the rest of the way. Um, it was ridiculous. There was no real reason for it. Consumers started to get frustrated by this gratuitous differentiation that added no value. Um, but there was also a lot of entrenched resistance to changing this, right? Um, there was also a lot of engineering hours spent trying to work around this, right? So for example, in the lower right part of the chart, you see that somebody actually came up with this great idea to do a three track uh, system so that you didn't have to actually switch the wheels. You could just lift it up, put it on a different track of a different gauge. Um, so there were some engineering hours spent like trying to figure out all these different train track gauges. There was also a lot of resistance from the companies who actually built a business around lifting the trains up off the track and switching the wheels, right? So there were actually riots when things started to try to converge, right? And of course, this was pre-Civil War, so North didn't want to work with South. The North got their standards from Europe, blah, blah, blah. Um, 30 years later, yes, 30 years later, everybody agreed on a common standard. Um, and then trains started to move faster, right? People didn't have those four to seven hour delays while they picked the trains up off the track and switched the, switched the wheels out. Um, the number of miles of track exploded from 50,000 miles to 90,000 miles of track. The cost to move gear from one side of the country to the another went from like 70 cents per, pound, uh, per ton mile to like two cents per ton mile, right? So just this convergence of a simple thing like a common track system exploded the pace of innovation, right? Uh, went from steam to coal to electricity. Um, trains got faster. Trains had less environmental impact. Things moved faster. Consumers ultimately won. And ultimately, we know where we are today. Um, openness always wins in the end. Now let's move to a little bit more modern example. Um, the web is based on an open system, an open foundation. If you think about how many engineering hours it would have taken to, for all of us to build our own operating systems, our own infrastructure code, before we ever got to build really cool, engaging applications, the web would be a different place today. We would have never realized some of the really engaging applications and, and experiences that we can experience on the web today. So there's lots of great examples here. I won't belabor the point because uh, you guys all know this story. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about a, a common trend that we see here, and it's the naysayers, right? Um, the same way that there were actually demonstrations about trying to get to a common rail gauge, um, you know, there was a very prominent technology executive in 2001 that predicted that by the end of 2001, Linux wouldn't even exist, okay? We all know where Linux is today, dominating the enterprise. Um, openness always wins when consumers have a voice in what they want, right? At the time, 
we were locked into proprietary risk, Unix, vertically integrated solutions. There was no real way to build a best of breed solution. Um, but how did it happen? Um, I think I'm not going to belabor this point either, but it was more focus, right? The engineering hours that were spent on best of breed to make that common code base better faster was a key part of the acceleration of, of this open source movement in software. We're intrigued by that and, and those benefits in the hardware space. Um, broke the proprietary lock-in, right? And ultimately, consumers won. But what I do want to say is that I think we celebrated prematurely, right? Because we broke free from proprietary risk Unix. So then we took open source Linux, and I believe we're deploying it on proprietary x86 today, right? We celebrated prematurely because it was a huge win, right? We were able to get open source op operating systems, but then we started to deploy it on x86 systems that even though, you know, we all talk about open standards, those systems are gratuitously differentiated, right? Switching from one train track to another, not very easy. The biggest consumers, like in the train systems, are the ones that are seeing this issue first, which is why Google, who came before us, Facebook, building our own infrastructure. We see this lack of interconnectedness across this world as a big issue, and that's why we launched Open Compute. So what is the current state of the hardware business? It's closed. It's not always going to be closed, because as I said, openness will always prevail. Openness will always win. But why is it closed? Well, it's closed because there's a huge capital expenditure in developing hardware, right? Um, I came from the hardware business. Um, when you start developing a project, you do it behind closed doors, you sign NDAs, you can't even tell your wife and kids about what you're working on, uh, and small groups of engineers build the best thing that they can build, but it's not an open development process. You're not showing it, uh, you're not evolving it with a community. Right? With Open Compute, we're putting raw specs out there. We have an incubation committee, and we are working on these things to evolve them together with a, with a much broader community. It's also really hard to iterate in hardware, right? So you can get a bunch of input into a, into a design, but ultimately one thing, one tangible good has to pop out. Um, but that's kind of where the hardware business is today. But like I said, I'm very encouraged in just a little more than a year the progress that the Open Compute Project has made. I call it slots and watts and chassis soup. Um, it's a mess. Uh, if you think about the number of engineering hours that are spent designing, let's take motherboards as an example. How many different ways can you put two Intel CPUs on a motherboard? You know? I mean, if you go and do a search on two-socket Intel motherboards, you're going to find a nauseating number of motherboards out there. And that, in my mind, is a waste of talent in the world delivering gratuitously differentiated motherboards that could have been better spent on innovation, right? This slots and Watson chassis soup analogy is like, I think we're filling ourselves up on these empty calories and never actually getting to the main course of innovation. Another example would be uh, power supplies. Like, how many different ways can you convert AC to DC to deliver 12-volt power to a motherboard? Go do a search on Newegg.com today. Guess how many results you'll find for PC power supplies? 465. How many engineering hours were wasted on those power supplies? Are they really that much better than each other? Right? I mean, we're already well north of 90% efficiency converting AC to DC. What could those engineering hours have been spent on? What might the industry look like if we weren't all building similar stuff and this big pile of, of slots and watts and chassis soup? I believe that if we apply the same principles that have caused software to move forward so fast to the hardware space, that the pace of innovation will speed up. Efficiency at scale, right? This is what I said about kind of the big consumers seeing the problem first. When you deploy things at scale, and I don't think anybody's going to argue with the trend towards cloud computing, which is going to yield a, a smaller number of larger data center environments, there are new and unique challenges when you deploy at scale. And your standard off-the-shelf silver boxes and, and this pile of motherboards and all this other stuff that's going on, we need help from the industry to innovate so that as we build out these large environments, we not only do it efficiently, but we also reduce the environmental impact of this pile of slots and watts as well. 
sharing best practices around how do you, how do you, what are the most recyclable materials that we can put into these devices, right? How can we actually accelerate the life cycle of these devices by doing partial upgrades so that we don't deploy all this back into the waste stream when we're all done? There's a lot of really interesting things that I think we can do if we share openly uh, and get these benefits applied to the hardware space. Now, I, I went to a little dark place there for a minute. Um, it's not that dark because as I said, openness always wins in the end. But the hardware business is an extremely entrenched business. There are large capital expenditures, those are real dollars. There's real engineers that do real work. These are the companies and the end users that have already signed up and believe in openness, right? It's not gonna be tomorrow or the next day, but I think certainly we don't want it to be 30 years like it took to get to a common train gauge. Maybe six to 10 years for Linux to dominate the enterprise. And what we all need to do is Vote with our wallets. Get more involved in applying openness into the hardware space, because I don't think we'll ever know what, how efficient and how cool the designs could have been until we extract those hours from the gratuitously differentiated pile of slots and watts and chassis soup and really apply it to something greater, right? This isn't gonna happen overnight. Um, some of the leading consumers here are seeing the same kind of trends that we're seeing, and that's why they're join joining. Um, you see some of the most entrenched players, some of the ones that I've talked about today that are like really closed systems that are building different gauge tra uh, you know, tracks. Can I take an HP blade, blade and stick it into a Dell blade chassis? No, why not, right? Is it really, is, does it really add value to me to have different racks and different power supply schemes? It doesn't add any value to my environment. Why can't we all just get along right there and work on something more innovative than the physical infrastructure that underlies where the innovation is actually happening? So, like I said, if you keep buying it, they're gonna keep building it. If you vote with your wallets and you believe in a culture of openness and you believe in the benefits of openness, then we can accelerate this trend. We won't have to wait 30 years for this trend to take hold in the hardware business. I don't think we can afford to wait 30 years, right? If you think about, um, like I was just watching um, Mark's presentation and being able to move you know, between different cloud infrastructures you know, or even like deploying Linux in, in an Azure cloud, openness always wins in the end, right? We're gonna be building these larger and larger data centers. These are gonna have unique challenges associated with them. And as consumers, if we don't really vote with our wallets and start saying we demand something better, we may never know what the, ho what, what the cost of an infrastructure as a service could have been. Because it'll be completely abstracted from us over time, right? How do we know if we wouldn't have had twice as, much, ha twice as many miles of train track if we didn't just converge the tracks? How do we know how far the cost of a ton mile of equipment would have gone down if we didn't converge and start working together on something like open compute? So again, if you keep buying it, they'll keep building it. If you vote with your wallets, this will change faster, and I appreciate the time with you today.